Today's topic is going to be about how the Estee Lauder companies leverages content marketing to drive sales, and specifically over $11.3 billion in net sales annually. Now, when I joined Estee Lauder was about nine months ago, I was honestly really surprised at just how big the organization is. So we have over 32 brands in the portfolio. Some of these brands you know, you love, you use them every single day, like Aveda or Matt Cosmetics or Clinique, um, Bumble and Bumble. Some of the brands are more indie, they're the fastest growing in the industry, like Too Faced Cosmetics, Becca, Le Labo, Tom Ford Beauty. And the combination of all of these brands under one umbrella makes us the number one um, prestige beauty company in the world across 150 countries, 1,200 freestanding stores, 46,000 employees. And the stat that I really love is that we have over 51% of women in SVP positions and above. Yeah, I know, it's pretty awesome. So the team that I'm on is called Global Consumer Engagement. And you can think of us like the startup within Estee Lauder. So we have only five people on the team, and we sit across the entire portfolio globally, and we're in charge of innovation and education across five core pillars, content, social, influencers, media, and retail. Now, 75% of the work that we do, it's like a SWAT team approach, so we'll dive into a brand, we'll help them build a strategy from the ground up, we'll pilot something new, and then we'll take that learning and then we'll scale it across the rest of the organization. 25% of the work that we do is very much your center of excellence model, where we're in charge of educating our 46,000 employees to be best in class at these five things. Now, one of the reasons that I love this job so much is that content fuels everything at Estee Lauder, and I really mean that quite literally. So every single day, we reach over 83 million people globally just across Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, every day in the U.S., we have over a million interactions. So that's likes, comments, and shares just in the U.S. alone. So if you're going to take that number, you're going to multiply that by all of our brands, by all of our regions, add email, add online traffic. That is a ton of content that we are creating every single day. And honestly, like that kind of scale of content, it makes sense because it just mirrors the way that people shop for beauty. So consumers watch a billion hours a day on YouTube, more than Netflix and Facebook video combined, and our industry is run by a bunch of teenagers. So we have 17 to 21 year olds drive 94% of revenue growth in the makeup category. And I always joke with my friends that my job is to sell lipstick on Instagram to 15 year olds, and that's actually not that far from the truth. The best example of all of this is Kylie Jenner. So does everyone know who Kylie Jenner is? I hope so. Um, she's the youngest of the Kardashians, and she created a cosmetics line 18 months ago called Kylie Cosmetics that went from $0 in revenue to $420 million in revenue. So that is so fast, and her secret sauce was selling lipstick on Snapchat. That's all she did. Um, just for comparison around how crazy that growth is in such a short amount of time, Lancome, one of our competitors, reached the same revenue growth, so 500 million, in 80 years. So 18 months to 80 years, it really just shows the power of content, social, and digital in driving revenue growth in this industry. Now, with all of this change on the consumer engagement team, we have one North Star, and it is creativity-driven, consumer-inspired storytelling. And what do we mean by this? We mean four things, and these are the questions that we ask ourselves with every single piece of content that goes out. Does this content stop me? Is it targeted and relevant? Does it make me stop in my tracks when I'm scrolling through the news feed? Does it reward me? Is it emotional, funny, useful, beautiful, and inspiring? And beauty in general is such an emotional category. Feeling beautiful on the inside and out means that we have to tell really emotional, compelling stories. Does it make it easy for me? Is it short and snackable? Is it visual? Does it stay with me? And is it branded early and often? And it has it, does it have a unique and ownable point of view? There are so many beauty brands out there that if your brand does not stick out from the rest, you're just gonna drown in all of the noise. So I wanna show an example of um, what content looks like at Estee Lauder and um, kick off with Clinique. Okay, so you spend the last five years obsessing over your kids until one day you realize, huh, you look like sh you start noticing it everywhere, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. Am I getting old? Yeah, that mirror is harsh though. I mean, things have changed a bit, but I can handle it. Here you go. That's a good man. I can't handle it. 
I mean, you certainly don't regret the events that might have aged you. The sleepless nights, the expressions that you've made. Mm. But it's time to do something about it. Like right now, before your kids totally destroy this place. Hi, I need something to instantly de-age me. I have just the thing. Clinique Fresh Press. <laughs> Hang on. Wait. No, for it. <sighs> Come on, guys. Activate the potency of 10% pure vitamin C with two drops twice a day in your moisturizer to instantly brighten and retexturize your skin at home because you aren't leaving your house again. In one week, even your husband hey babe. will notice a difference. Is that a new shirt? No. Your skin looks different. About 36% brighter. More radiant. Glowing. I love you guys. But most importantly, you feel great. Mommy got some immunities. Huh? You can't win them all. Okay, so I love that story because it's so relatable. I think these thoughts all the time too. But I love it even more because this piece of content really knows how to drive sales. So not only did this YouTube video get 4.75 million views on YouTube, but Clinique had a really smart retargeting and sequencing strategy once someone hit that content that drove a 1,300% lift in search interest for Clinique, for Clinique Fresh Pressed, and for Vitamin C. It drove a 20% lift in brand consideration, and the product is sold out everywhere globally. I was trying to sneak a sample of it, and they didn't even have one to give me. Um, so definitely great emotional storytelling, which drives sales. So now I want to go into four things that we've learned along the way. And because I sit across a portfolio, I'm able to see all the revenue numbers for all of our brands. And while I can't share every sales data with you, what I can share with you is the stuff that I know really, really works. And so we're going to get pretty tactical here, um, but I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. So the first thing that we've learned is that data drives our content strategy. Now I feel like kind of like every speaker gets up and says something similar to this, but what I think is uni unique to Estee Lauder is how we approach getting data, drawing insights out of it, and then doing something with it. So first, we built a framework to simplify how we look at data. So there's so many, many data points within Estee Lauder, so many channels, so many platforms, but all we do is we ask ourselves three questions, and that's it. And every single team asks these questions every week, every month. What do people want? How is our brand performing? And what are we working towards? So thinking about consumer needs and what people want, the first step that we think about is how do we track trends based on deep social listening? So we look at four different audience segments on a weekly basis. We look at influencers, so the top 1,000 influencers um, in the beauty space. We mine all of their comments all of their fans, everything that they're reading and talking about. We look at beauty mavens. So these are like the beauty junkies in the world who are blogging on Reddit, who are sharing stuff on Sephora blogs. These are the early adopters in the world. Online media, so every media publication, but particularly Refinery29, Vogue, those kinds of beauty and fashion pubs. And then consumers, everybody like you and me. And so what we really try to do is identify where do trends start, in which group, how do trends move from one audience segment to the next, and how fast do they accelerate? So what is the acceleration rate, and how quickly do they grow? From this information, we then look at how trends move from rising evergreen and declining patterns. So let's take for an example, fake freckles, that was really big. It's kind of when you get like an eyeliner and you poke it on your face to make it look like you have freckles. Um, I'm not really sure why people do it, but they do. And we're able to see, for example, what are the search patterns? Is that rising or declining? What is the Maven conversation? What is the general consumer conversation? Our ability to identify where trends start and how they move and how quickly they move from rising to decelerating is absolutely crucial for us to create the right content, invest in the right trends, and then more importantly, put products out that we know are going to drive sales. So let me give you an example. MAC Cosmetics is the number one makeup brand in the world in the prestige category. They were founded around the 90s and they've always been a trendsetter since the day that they were founded. They have over 20,000 makeup artists in the world and they are known for doing the makeup backstage at Fashion Week. So Milan, London, Paris, New York. Last February, so just um, this past spring, they created a look at Fashion Week um, called the Popsicle Lips. So, which is this. Now, when I first saw this, I thought they made a huge mistake 
Like they don't know how to put lipstick on. What is going on here? Very worried. And quite frankly, Mac got blasted in the media. Um, Refiner29, Bustle, everyone picked it up. You guys can Google it. But lo and behold, six months later, Popsicle Lips became the number one trend of this past summer. Um, in every single like consumer segment, this was the number one trend. And the reason is because a trend started with a subculture that it's like Devil Wears Prada, honestly. Started with a subculture that um, the consumers might not have necessarily gravitated towards, but then the trend moved into a different creative expression that consumers wanted to use and wear every single day. And so with this one, we identified that Mac got on the trend really early. Here, they actually created the trend, and they were able to get ahead of the curve six months later. All right, the next step is to analyze content and brand performance. Now, these are the exact metrics that we track every single week across every brand. Um, but more important than these metrics, um, what I've really learned since I've been at Estee Lauder is that your share of growth is the most important thing to look at. So most people, they're looking at these metrics and how they perform against the, the prior week or the prior month. What we look at is how do we perform against the competition so how our brand performs against a share of the competitive set and or the share of the category. And our ability to grow that share over time is what we're really concerned about. All right, so once we understand these metrics and we share them on a weekly basis, I'll give you an example of how they come to life. So we'll take these trends, we'll create a one pager, and back in March, we sent, started sending this out to all of our makeup artists at Mac um, in the UK on a weekly basis via Facebook at Workplace. We identified, hey, one of the trends that we're seeing right now in March is glitter lips. This is starting to be really big in the Maven community. And so we sent that out to our makeup artists and we said, try to create some awesome glitter lip content for us. Within one week, they turned that around and we saw a 3.94% engagement rate on that content. That's compared to a 1 to 1.5% 1 engagement rate against a competitive set. So we knew really quickly, hey, this trend might actually turn into something a lot bigger, and our consumers really like this. A really easy way to activate your employees to create content and to A-B test to see if things are working or not. So even though maybe not all of you are in the beauty industry, think about how you can act activate your employees to make things real and to really test and learn. All right, the third step is to map everything against the business goals. Now, this is a super simple chart, but it is the one one-pager that we use when we're activating any campaign at Estee Lauder. So we look at the funnel, and we map out what is our objective, who is our audience, what is our desired outcome. And desired outcome is like, in plain English, we want to sell more lipstick, things like that. Then we map out the tactics business KPIs and media KPIs. And this is the one pager that is used to ground every media agency that we work with, our platform partners, Snapchat, Facebook, Google, et cetera, our creative teams and our cross-functional teams. And we use this as a goalpost as we move forward in the campaign. Okay, the second point. We create product with content in mind. So from the early stages of R&D, we already think about how is this product going to perform on social? Is it, does it have a transformative impact and is it gonna look really cool on YouTube? Um, how is it gonna perform on Instagram? Is it shareable? Will influencers pick it up? Is it something that we can send to them in a gift box? I wanna give one example of one of our brands, Becca. I'm not sure how many of you guys know them. They're a really small indie brand, really fast growing. In May, they did a collaboration with Chrissy Teigen. So Chrissy Teigen is super famous. She's a chef. She's married to John Legend. She's really funny. She's a little bit of a comedian. And they worked together to create a custom palette, which was highlighter, blush, bronzer, um, some other stuff. So I'll give you a quick sneak peek into what this thing was all about. So obviously this thing was not staged at all. They just brought Chrissy Teigen into a set. They're like, we know Chrissy loves cooking. Let's have her cook up this palette. And she just made it up on the fly. Um, this became like the pre-launch video that was sent out. I think it was about like a month or so prior to the actual launch. And in within 24 hours, um, this post that she put out had 4.5 million views on Instagram. 340K likes, and then she did a second post that had 330K likes. So I want to compare that against some of her other sponsorships out there. If we look at Smirnoff, 
Um, just a month earlier, a post had 2.2 million views, and Vita Coco had 1.9 million views. So just like a really like clear apples to apples comparison of what authenticity and content really looks like in terms of how it drives engagement. And you can really see it in the caption here. Chrissy writes, I cannot wait for you all to try my new glow palette in caps. Every time I use it, I can't believe it's actually mine. It's perfection. Be sure to follow at Becca Cosmetics for all the details. Hashtag Becky and Chrissy, hashtag Becca partner. The Vita Coco one goes, it's hard work, but somebody's got to do it. Hashtag plant manager. So it kind of sounds like a social media person or community manager wrote that Vita Coco one, but 4.5 million views versus 1.9, um, pretty big difference. Um, and the lesson here is ownership and authenticity is key to performance. So give your influencers, give your content creators ownership over that product, over that creative, and you will see the results.